What is up you guys? Welcome back to my channel and if you're new here just welcome. My name is Gemma Jade but today I have some real demonic hauntings for you guys. So I'm almost always dealing in the paranormal no matter what I'm doing but because it's Halloween season I really didn't get to do much last year and the stuff I tried to do kind of fell on deaf ears because um, I wasn't that good at it and I had like 70 subscribers. So I wanted to do something this year and I wasn't sure what. So I think just from now into Halloween, I'm going to go like super scary as best as I can. We'll see how it goes. But I think you guys are really going to enjoy this. I found two really creepy, actually really scary events of seemingly demonic hauntings in houses. And the first one, the guy wrote a book and I explained a little bit in here that without buying the book, I don't know a ton of what happened, but I do plan on buying that book and revisiting this haunting. But here's like an overall picture. And the second one, um, you're just going to have to wait and see. So let's jump right in. In 2002, paranormal author and lecturer Bill Bean shared his experience with living in and surviving a true demonic haunting. In 1970, the Bean family bought a house just outside of Baltimore, Maryland, and right away, they started to experience some rather strange things. One of the first things reportedly happening in this haunted den of demons was when young Bill, only seven at the time, heard pounding and banging coming from the roof right above his bedroom. Of course, his parents and the rest of the family kind of dismissed this as maybe a random noise or as always the imaginings of a young boy who has an overactive imagination. Also, not too long after moving in, the family began to experience random doors, mainly the one in their back bedroom, opening all by themselves and violently slamming shut again. This isn't just like a door creeping open. This is like bam over and over again. This would go on all night long and sometimes even happen during the day as well. Not too long after Bill told his parents what he was hearing on his roof at night, his mother, Patricia, started to think that maybe there was something to what her son had been experiencing and what her son had been telling her. Very soon after he was telling his parents this and after they were dismissing it and all of that, Patricia was on the phone with her mother and she wasn't anywhere near the bathroom when this happened. Nobody else was in the house when this happened either. The sink in the bathroom overflowed and flooded the entire room, started kind of coming out into the hallway before Patricia noticed it. It turned on by itself and did this according to her. She noticed that most of the activity would happen when she was there by herself. Her husband was at work, the kids were in school, and she was being haunted. She would complain that she would make all of the beds in the house and then immediately upon leaving the rooms, the beds would be tossed and unmade again. There was no logical explanation for this because there was nobody else, no other human in the house with her at the time that these things were happening. It happened constantly to the point where she considered just not doing her daily chores around the home anymore because whatever she had cleaned or fixed, the entities or whatever they were would just go right behind her and like mess everything up anyways. The man of the house, Patricia's husband and Bill's father, whose name is George, suddenly and progressively became angry and developed a drinking problem. He would also leave the house and not come back for days at a time. This was not the usual behavior for him as he was known as a family man who loved and took care of his wife and children. Billy's older sister, Patty, was terrified of her own bedroom. She hated being anywhere near it or in the hallway that was attached to it. And this is the same hallway and I'm pretty sure the same bedroom where the door would constantly slam. She claims it was freezing cold even in the summertime. She so desperately wanted to escape that house that she married at 16 years old just as a means to get away from whatever was haunting not only the police, but seemingly her family as well. That's really sad. As I said, there's a whole book out that Bill Bean wrote. So the details I could gather online without purchasing the book, like, I think there's a lot more to this and I'm kind of excited about it. So that's what I'm saying. A lot of my scripts are kind of done on the fly. Like I'll start Googling something and then I'll be like, ooh, what's that? And then I'll go and do a script on it. So that's why I kind of Okay, whatever. So more to come on this haunting because I want more details. 
George Bean eventually left the house one day and just never came back. And soon after this, a dark entity attacked Patricia so violently and terrified her so badly that she started sleeping with her two sons because she's too frightened to sleep alone or to leave them to sleep alone, even together, um, all night long in the dark and in this demonic house. It was getting really violent. She was so terrorized, she ended up suffering a mild stroke and having to be hospitalized for it. By this time, Bill was older, though I'm not sure by how much, and he started to understand that whatever was in the house, though it messed with him and his brother quite often, was mainly focusing it atta its attacks on his mom, on Patricia. And that's how she ended up having the stroke. At least that's what he believes. Everyone involved to this day are convinced the spirit and their constant and progressively more violent attacks caused the hospitalization and stroke. Patricia eventually realized her husband wasn't going to be coming back, so she started a relationship with a man named Richard Tyson, who almost immediately upon entering the house started having his own paranormal encounters. He started to see the spirit of a lady with long blonde hair wearing a nightgown. The family later had a Roman Catholic priest perform a blessing on the home in an attempt to get rid of the spirits. They were given a bottle of holy water as well. Shortly after the blessing, the family was violently attacked by unseen spirits, all of them, and young Billy attempted to rid the house of the spirits, but his attempts failed. And the family finally left the house that same day, the same day of all these violent attacks. 10 months after moving out of the house, Patricia passed away. A man named John Romaine, who was a local and retired police officer, had heard Bill Bean talking on a radio show and knew that he wrote a book. He contacted him in 2002 saying he had information regarding the haunting and he also had information about people who had experienced similar incidents. And he had experienced haunting and similar terrifying incidents in the house himself, so he got in touch with Bill Bean. He shared with Bill that the house was built on the site of a rifle range back in the 1860s to the 1900s. And he stated that rifles were known to backfire, causing serious injuries back then. He also added that the heavy footsteps Bill heard was that of a soldier named Edward Zipperian, who was badly injured and died years later, an angry man who haunted the house. Romaine also showed Bean a pair of old heavy combat boots that the soldiers wore at the time. This brought Bill Bean some new information about the haunting. And he said, quote, We went from a very loving family when we first moved into the home to a family void of affection that lived and survived on a day-to-day -day basis. I believe it was the evil force and entities in the home that made my mother ill and kept her in that environment. End quote. He said he never discussed what happened to himself or his family in the 10 years they lived in that house, not even with his siblings who shared most of the experiences until he decided to write the book in 2002. This is all I have on this particular demonic haunting, but I'm definitely going to be purchasing the book and soon, and I'm going to revisit this and give you all some more in-depth details, specific deets, okay, about what exactly is known as the demon house and maybe even why. So, okay guys, this one really threw me for a loop and I'm not sure how I never came across this or never heard of this before. I was absolutely shocked and mesmerized as I read through the information. I'm not really sure to call this one except the demonic haunting of Latoya A and her family. Let's get to it. 32-year-old Latoya A. and her three children and her mother, whose name is Rosa, moved into a rented house on Carolina Street in Gary, Indiana in November of 2011. Almost immediately upon moving into the home, though, they started to notice some very strange things happening. Flies would constantly swarm all over the house, and about a month after moving in, in December of 2011, there would randomly and constantly be wet boot prints tracked all over the house, especially in the basement and in the kitchen. Boots that didn't belong to anyone in the home, and also it was even when it wasn't pre precipitating outside, like no rain, no snow, no morning mist. There were strange noises and banging sounds heard from the basement almost constantly as well. It was things like these that made the family start questioning their own sanity for the first three months they lived in their home. However, in March of 2012, all doubt would be removed about whether or not they were losing it or if something really terrifying was happening in their rental house. 
The family had some company over and the adults were up late into the night hanging out, talking, possibly listening to music or watching TV. And the children in the house, three of them, were presumably asleep. That's when LaToya decided to go and check on her 12-year-old daughter. Immediately upon entering the room, LaToya started screaming at the top of her lungs, which got the attention first of her mother, who came running into the 12-year-old girl's room after her. There they saw LaToya's daughter levitating off of her bed, seemingly unconscious. Rosa said she thought, quote, what's going on? Why is this happening? End of quote. Eventually, the noise caused everyone in the house to go into the girl's bedroom and witness the spectacle that was taking place. The group of them all decided to just start praying. As they did this and recited prayers over and over again out loud, the 12-year-old girl slowly started moving through the air and back down again to her bed. She was still unconscious, and when she finally came to, she remembered nothing about the incident. LaToya said that she was absolutely terrified for herself and her family, but was nowhere near in a place financially where she could even consider moving out of this house. All they could do was pray and endure the frightening experiences that were to come. The family tried to do anything they possibly could to not only get some answers, but also to get some help. They contacted churches and alleged clairvoyants, most of whom wouldn't even listen or believe what they had to say. Those who did seem to take an interest or at least believe what they were saying told them general things they thought would help, like washing the children's hands in oil and burning sage throughout the house. Many of the clairvoyants did warn LaToya that the home was haunted by more than 200 demonic entities all at once, all haunting this house. Rosa and LaToya said that they followed every single instruction to the letter, but to no avail. Even in times of seeming silence, they could still feel the presences there, and the children increasingly showed signs of becoming possessed by demons. They claimed the children's eyes would bulge, they would have sickening smiles and evil grins upon their faces, and the youngest boy would sit in the closet and have full-blown conversations with someone or something nobody else could see or hear. On one occasion, this child, the little boy that would sit in the closet, the youngest boy, was picked up and thrown into the hallway while he was standing in the bathroom. And it was really violent and the force was unseen. The children weren't possessed all of the time, though. These things would come and go, and this is very common with possessions in the beginning and even the middle stages. Latoya would say that there were many occasions where she herself felt weak and unnaturally warm, and her body would tremble and shake for no apparent reason. When she took her children to see doctors, they insisted that Child Protective Services be called, and when the doctors and caseworkers would meet with the children, they would curse at them in low and guttural voices and sometimes even growl. During one of these visits with CPS at the hospital, the youngest boy was lifted off the ground and thrown against the wall right in front of everyone in the room. The official report says he was, quote, lifted and thrown into the wall with nobody touching him, end of quote. LaToya was being investigated for possible mental illness and child abuse and or neglect. She was sent to a psychiatrist who concluded she was, quote, of sound mind, end quote. In the CPS report, it was written by the caseworker and later corroborated by a nurse who was in the room that the nine-year-old boy, quote, displayed a weird grin and then walked backwards up a wall to a ceiling, end quote. He then flipped over his grandmother and landed on his feet, the whole while never letting go of his grandmother's hand. The nurse told a reporter, quote, there's no way he could have done that, end of quote. The case manager for CPS, whose name was Valerie Washington, said in a police report that she believed a, quote, evil influence could be affecting the family. And when asked if the boy had walked up a ceiling in an acrobatic maneuver, she said it was in fact a slow glide that could not have been performed naturally. These were unnatural movements. I mean, obviously, somebody walking up a wall. Of course, CPS did find a reason to take custody of LaToya's children, and they said it's because it was found that she was neglecting their education. LaToya, though, stood firm that this evil and ghoulish activity all of the time was keeping the children up all night, and they were simply too exhausted to even keep their heads up, let alone go to school. That makes sense to me. Records from clinical psychologists did, however, indicate that the younger boy acted possessed when he was asked questions he didn't like. I don't know what that means. Like, what questions didn't he like? It doesn't, that they don't elaborate on that. It's like they just threw it in there to put doubt in people's heads. I believe this 100%, by the way. Later on, Miss Washington went to the home to check on its condition and was joined by three police officers. During the visit, one of their recorders malfunctioned and another recorded audio in which a voice whispered, quote, hey, end quote. 
And this is according to police records. They also took photos of the house, and when these were looked at later, it appeared as if cloudy faces were in the images. These unlikely sounding events were detailed and documented by a string of authorities and professional people who had first-hand experience with the family and or in the house, as well as the family themselves, friends, loved ones, who had all gone for a visit or otherwise been in the home at any given time while this stuff was going on. Police also observed strange goings on at the house and a captain of the city's force has said he is quote, a true believer end quote, that the house is in fact haunted. After a string of apparent paranormal events at the house hardened police officers, including that aforementioned captain, even declared themselves too frightened to stay there after nightfall and numerous city officials refused to even step foot on the property to investigate. There are hundreds of pages of these official documents and there have been dozens upon dozens of interviews with all parties involved, including CPS caseworkers and managers, the police, priests, friends, family, neighbors, psychologists, and other mental health professionals, and even some medical doctors and more. All of them eventually agree that these happenings in the house are worse than something straight from a horror movie. Worse because it was all really happening and there seemed to be nothing anybody could even do about it. Gary Police Captain Charles Austin told the newspaper that he had initially been skeptical of the family's claims. I mean, obviously. But after conducting interviews and visiting the home himself, he now admits, quote, I'm a believer. The police chief added that after he left the house, the radio in his car malfunctioned and that his garage later refused to open. Even more chillingly, he said that the driver's seat in one of his other cars started moving backward and forward on its own. And according to his mechanic, this could have caused an accident. Like, this was dangerous. During a second visit to the home in May of 2012, they were joined by a priest, Reverend Michael Magano, who had been asked by a hospital chaplain to perform an exorcism on one of the boys. While at the home, a Child Protective Services family case manager said that she touched liquid she saw in the basement and later suffered finger pain right at the spot where she had touched it, and then she felt like she was having a panic attack. She said, quote, we felt like someone was in the room with us, someone breathing down our necks, end of quote. She said and added that later she experienced a series of medical problems from random burns to numerous broken bones. After the visit, the priest performed a minor exorcism on Latoya, which consisted of prayers, statements, and appeals to cast out demons. But after these smaller exorcisms, he said that he was finally given the go-ahead by Bishop Dale Melshek of the Diocese of Gary, and he decided to carry out three more powerful exorcisms on Latoya in his church in Maryville in June of 2012. Police officers were present. Latoya stated, quote, I was hurting all over from the inside out. I'm trying to do my best to be strong, she remembered. Not long after the exorcisms, Latoya moved out of the home and to Indianapolis, and she said that she'd had no further problems. And after six months, she regained custody of her children from CPS. The house in Gary has tenants to this day, but the landlord said there have been no further problems at the address. Does this mean there have been problems before Latoya and her family moved in? I would really love to research that. And if I come up with anything, I will definitely let you know. I am tongue tied tonight. My goodness. Of the bone chilling and terrifying activity at her former home, Latoya said, quote, when you hear something like this, don't just assume it's not real because I've lived it. I know it's real. End of quote. Guys, this is all I have for you today. I really hope you enjoyed this short little video on demonic hauntings. I have so much more to get through and film because I'm, I want to do something really um, awesome for Halloween, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to. So that's why the videos are going to be a little bit shorter um, this week and getting up to Halloween so I can save that time to prepare for you all. All right. And if nothing else, I'll see you fireside on Halloween night decked out in my costume um, please be sure and give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoyed spending this time with me. If you liked this video, if you liked hanging out with me, subscribe if you haven't already. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Check out some of my other videos. I would really appreciate it. If you are already subscribed, please click on the notification bell and make sure that it's turned on to all. Otherwise, you may not get notifications. And I know a lot of you guys have been concerned about that. Also, check to make sure you are subscribed if you already did if that makes sense, because um, a lot of people are telling me that they weren't subscribed anymore and they hadn't done that. All right. Please spread the love by sharing this video. I would also appreciate that. And 
If you can, check out the description box for information on the three live streams I do each week. One solo on my channel on Wednesday nights where I read Oracle cards intuitively live for the people that come in. Pretty much anyone who wants one, even though I try to limit it. I can't ever say no. Um, and what Steve Stockton and I, Stemma, do on Friday nights and Sunday nights over on Miss Missing Persons and Mysteries. Always remember justice for Caleb Smith. We are working, as you all know, if you um, follow all of my videos, I've been saying for a long time, we're working on getting Caleb's mother, April Arrington, back in for another live interview. And the reason I say justice for Caleb Smith and promote that live interview every single video, no matter what, is because there still hasn't been any justice for Caleb or Keeslin and so many others out there. This isn't just about Caleb and April and Keeslin and her parents. This is about addiction and mental illness and people not being throwaway people. But we will get more into that in the next interview as soon as, you know, we can all get our schedules together. So that's why I'm always pushing justice for Caleb Smith. If you're not familiar with the case, check out the video I did on it or the one on missing persons and mysteries. Either way, okay, to all of my STEMites, my Gemites, those of you helping me build my Gempire, the tribe, the squad, the other members of the Island of Misfit Toys. I love you guys so, so very, very much. Also in the description box, you will find my email. If you have any encounters with the supernatural and or paranormal that you want me to make a part of my listener encounters series, go on and email me at gemmajadeparanormal at gmail.com. And I will email you back and let you know. Well, I'll try to email you back and let you know when your story is going to be used. I really, really would appreciate it. And PayPal, Patreon, and Amazon wishlist gift link in the description box. Say that 10 times fast. Guys, be kind to each other. Be kind to yourselves. Smile at a stranger. All right. It costs nothing to be a nice person. Always go in grace. Have your best day. Have your best night. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>